You ready to worship the Lord? Welcome to the first Sunday in Advent. Let's stand to our feet. him up. How we long for you, Lord. You are so good to call us out of the darkness and into your marvelous light. Here we gather again as brothers and sisters in the Lord, the family of God. We're so glad to be part of the family of God. Would you turn and greet one another in this family in the love of the Lord Jesus?
Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations, nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. O oh Lord God of the universe, King forever, we ask you today that you would arise and shine once again in our hearts, that during this Advent season as we retell the same old, old story, that wonderful story of how God took on flesh and dwelled among us. Arise, shine in us, Lord.
us with so great a love, Lord God, and we've come here to worship you. We're asking that you would move in our hearts, Lord God, that you would move in our lives, Lord God, that you would do a great thing in our hearts, even here this morning as we have gathered together here to worship you. Lord, we would pray for all your people in all this world, all around this world, gathering this day, this first day of the week, Lord God, to worship you. We love you. We thank you. We come before you, and we pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give thanks to our God. Maybe if you're a, a little new to the Bible, you might be saying, what does that lyric mean? Tear off the roof and lower me down. 
Uh, I hope they're not going to tear this. Well, if Jesus tears off the roof, that would be good. But they were bringing a man to Jesus because every time he prayed for people, miracles kept happening. And some friends were bringing a man who had been, you know, couldn't walk from birth. And they couldn't get through the crowd. Jesus was inside a house. People were gathered all in the house, all around the house. They couldn't get through. So they went up on the roofs, which were flat at the time. And they took off the panels and they tied ropes on the little mat that he's laying, lying on and they lowered him down right in front of Jesus. Whatever it takes to get our hearts in the presence of Jesus. Whatever it takes for you this morning to get your heart in the presence of Jesus. He said, draw near to me and I will draw near. I will draw near to you. Well, he was in the room with those disciples the night before he went to the cross. Now, it was their Passover holiday. It's kind of like our 4th of July. It was remember, they were remembering when they got free from their slavery in Egypt. And so they would talk late into the night. Families would gather, friends would gather. So this is Jesus and the 12 men who together they had traveled 24 seven for three years, camping out here, there and everywhere. Now at the end of three years, Jesus knows what's gonna happen the next day. And he knows he's gonna be on the cross by 9 a.m. the next morning. So they would talk and talk and talk and they would sing and sing. Just the great songs of praise to our God. We know them as the book of Psalms in the Bible. That word Psalm means songs. And they sang and sang. So I've been thinking about, you know, when babies were born in, in first century Israel and in many places around the world, and even in our nation in earlier days, your neighbors and your friends would all come that night and gather around your house. And there'd be musical instruments, there would be singing, just rejoicing with the parents of this new child. But you know, the night that Jesus was born, his parents weren't in the hometown of his mother Mary. They weren't in Nazareth because the Roman emperor dictated that everyone in all his empire must go to the home of their ancestral home. So Joseph was from the house of David, which was Bethlehem. And so they had to walk 90 miles to Bethlehem. The, Jesus is born in a stable on a back alley and there's nobody around rejoicing. There's nobody around rejoicing with, with Mary, with Joseph. Nobody singing as Jesus was born. There were angels up in heaven out over the fields as the shepherds are stunned to see the sky full of angels. But right there in Bethlehem, nobody was singing. So Jesus took the bread the night of that last supper. He gave thanks to our Father and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat this, do this in remembrance of me. He knew they would need to remember they would need to sing. They would need to worship, to gather together again and again and again. They, he knew by later that night when the soldiers came, they'd be scared to death. And the next day as he's hanging on a cross dying, they'd be scared to death. But he knew it was going to be on a Friday he died, on a Sunday. He knew the Father would raise him up from that death and he would come to them and they'd be stunned. They'd be stunned. He did conquer even the power of death. He'd be with them for 40 more days and then he had uh, 10 more days, 40 more days, and then he was gone, gone. He knew they'd need to remember, 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 sing and sing and sing his praise for you and me to keep our courage, to stay strong, to have confidence. We need to remember the incredible love of Jesus that went to a cross for all of us. He took the cup that night, he gave it to them, he said, this is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this and be glad. Remember, rejoice in the mercy, the grace, the love of our great, great God. We humble ourselves before him when we take this tiny little piece of bread here, we drink from this tiny little cup. We humble ourselves before this great God. If you have faith, remember him, humble yourself before him. Take that little piece of bread drink from that tiny little cup. If you don't have faith, this could be the morning you decide to trust in Jesus.
Lord Jesus, we love you so much. We are so grateful. You left the glory of heaven to come to this earth to take upon yourself our flesh and all of our griefs and sorrows, finally to take upon yourself even our sin there on that cross. We love you and we thank you. We pray, Father, pouring our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And can we give thanks amen, to our God? Amen. amen. Good morning, church. How we doing? Right. Woo, God is good. All the time. All the time. Amen. Hey, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Mount Zion. If it's your first time here, a special welcome to you. Uh, maybe you are online with us. Uh, welcome. Uh, hey, if it is your first time, so maybe this is not your exact first time, but you've been here a couple weeks, we have something this Wednesday evening. We have a Bible study. We're going to be over in the youth tent. Anyone can show up. It's an Advent series. And Steve Presser, our director of adult discipleship, is leading that. And so we'll have like a, a group time together, and then we'll break into smaller groups. But this is a great opportunity to come together, to get in the Word, to, to go over some questions. All of the videos are on the website, and they're on YouTube, so you can look at the notes right under the video. So I hope you will come check out that Bible study uh, maybe you've never been in a small group. This is a great opportunity for you to see what that is all about. So come on out. Hey, if you are new, would you be so bold? There's a little uh, tear-off insert on the bulletin that you received. Write your name and contact information. We'd love to reach out to you to just have a little conversation. Um, and so I'll be in the lobby, and there's others if you have questions. But you can write your name on that. We have three offering containers here. Just write your name on that, put it in the offering, um, and we'll reach out to you. And then also on that bulletin, there's a place to write down prayer requests. We are a praying church, and we want to be praying with you and for you. So you can write down your prayer. Uh, again, place it in the, the container. And there's a team that prays every Wednesday. They pray every Wednesday for all the prayer requests put in there. So uh, please do that. I want to invite, invite you Thursday evening up in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. We are having a night of healing prayer, and so we will be gathered there in the sanctuary just praying for one another, uh, for physical healing, emotional healing, relational healing, and I would invite you to come. It's just a very quiet, beautiful time of praying. Uh, maybe you know you need healing. Maybe there's a loved one that you would invite to come, and we'll just gather around uh, one another and pray. Earlier on that Thursday, uh, over in the youth tent, so late afternoon, we are hosting something for Hartford County government called a Holiday Resource Fair. These things are in your bulletin there. And this is uh, resources for persons who are in need in our county. And as you know, the financial need of persons are soaring. We know that very well in the office. I see Courtney up here. Courtney and Cindy are answering phone calls all the time, uh, people seeking financial help for all kinds of reasons. This is a great opportunity for folks, so if you would help us spread the word, maybe you're in financial need, there will be a lot of resources over here uh, for you. Wanted to uh, lift up, uh, if you haven't gotten one of these yet, this uh, has all of our Christmas gift drives. There's five different gift drives going on. On the other side is all of our Christmas events. Uh, I wanna thank you, you are being very generous for our various uh, different Christmas gift drives. I want to lift up two of them this morning, and one is for our Hannah's Hope Group is partnering with Angels of Addiction, and they are uh, collecting Christmas gifts for homeless children in Baltimore City and Hartford County. And uh, you all took all the tags off the tree last weekend, and I had to tell Paula Hamilton to bring more for Sunday evening, and uh, she did. So the tree is restocked out there. Uh, just take a tag off that Christmas tree. The other gift drive I want to lift up is we are... Uh, sending Christmas cards, as always, with gift cards inside them to the children in Warncliffe, West Virginia. And uh, you can contact the church office. Uh, if you get one of these, Kara Main's phone number's on here, and she's organizing all of that. 
I think we've covered 175 or I so of them. I hear there are 21 left. 21 left, so uh, help us out with that. Amen. So we have an informational uh, meeting Tuesday evening. This is for a mission trip to Belize, and we talked about this last week, but I just want to remind you that will be this Tuesday evening. We have a relationship with a church down there in Belize, and so if you are interested, you want to learn more about this opportunity, it's going to be happening in early June, the actual mission trip. The, the informational meeting will be Tuesday evening. I have flyers out in the lobby, but it'll be up at the other building, not here. All right, you're going to pray and for I'm us? I'm going to pray for us, yes. Amen. Uh, Father God, you're so good. We thank you for your love for us, Lord, your patience with us. You're so good to us. God, we come here today at all different places. We might be really struggling or we might be really going through some good times. And Lord, we just come here just pouring out our hearts in gratitude for you, Jesus, that you came to this earth, that you went to that cross. And we're so thankful that we can be here and, and get in your word. And Lord, we just pray you would encourage us through your word. Holy Spirit, that you would teach us, give Pastor Craig the, the words to say as we get into your word. And we love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And hey, hey, Andy, I wanted to tell you, my, my wife uh, asked me the other day, have you seen the dog bowl anywhere? And, uh, the I dog bowl? The dog bowl. And I said, I didn't know he bowled. Uh -huh. that, that's a... Yeah, that's pretty good, huh? <laughs> and then the dog ate all the Scrabble tiles the other night. I took him to the vet. No word yet. You know, it's been a while since he told jokes. That's so why. I wonder why. That's exactly why. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving right along. <laughs> oh, my. I got hundreds of them. <laughs> I used to, for many, many years, for decades, would always pick on people who were sitting somewhere near the front and tell a story about them. Every single week, I'd tell a joke. And uh, as the years went by, I realized that people younger than myself were just looking at me like, Huh? <laughs> I just got to realize humor's kind of generational, so we dropped that. And uh, well, here's what we're going to do uh, this morning. We're going to begin for these next four weeks, setting our eyes on Jesus and this amazing truth that that little baby that Mary was holding in her arms was God himself. That man that was walking the streets of Galilee and Judea was God himself. When they heard Jesus, they heard God. When they touched Jesus, they touched God. More than a great prophet, more than a great teacher, more than a great miracle worker, this Jesus was God himself. The one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, the Father, sent the Son. And the Bible says that this, this God, the Son, you know when we say that, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like I have a son, so I existed first, then was my son you know, and, and now grandson, right? So we think, well, wait a minute, did God the Father come first and then the Son? No, this is the Father as in the Son accountable to the Father. One God who has always been Father, Son, Holy Spirit. At the right time, the Father sent the Son, God the Son, Jesus, left all the glory of being God in heaven, came, was conceived in Mary's womb, right? Took on human flesh, lived here among us, this was God himself, ultimately, who went to that cross. If God just chose somebody to go to the cross for all of us, we'd say, okay, that's great, that's nice. But God himself, God himself went to hell for you and me to rescue us. So for these next four weeks, uh, we're going to be setting our eyes, setting our minds on this great reality that God himself showed up here on this earth, not born in a palace, not with armies, right, not in great wealth. God himself showed up in all the struggles, in the hardest struggles of life, ultimately went to that cross to save, to rescue you and me. So what we're going to think about this morning is, and for these four weeks, the birth of Jesus, of him coming to this world, and this morning we're going to think about his mother, Mary. So we're going to get right into it here. Let's look in Luke chapter 1 here. It says, in the sixth month. So this is the sixth month of another woman's pregnancy, Mary's great aunt, Elizabeth, who was an older woman and, 
an angel came and said to uh, she and her husband, you're going to have a child, and they're like, whatever, right? And she conceived. So in the sixth month of her pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, the word angel means messenger, these spiritual messengers that God sends from time to time with messages to his people. We're not told the names of very many of the angels. The fact that we're told the name of this particular angel, Gabriel, tells us that this was a, or is a prominent angel in heaven. And we don't, you know, people have all kinds of ideas and speculations about all that. The Bible says very little about it. But this is a prominent angel from heaven is sent to a city of Galilee. Now, when they say city, we would say small village. A city or a town or a village of Galilee. Galilee's the rural, very poor region of Israel to the, the northern part of Israel to this little town named Nazareth. Now, anybody who was reading in the first century Luke's account, and they're reading this for the first time, and they're like, wait a minute, Nazareth? Really, Nazareth? Nazareth was like the worst town in Israel. It had a reputation that actually followed Jesus his whole life. It was extremely poor. The crime rate of all of Galilee and really all of Israel was through the roof. The people were being treated so horribly by the Romans, taxed almost to death. They're barely surviving, so crime is crazy. Poverty, this little town of Nazareth, the archaeologists would tell us maybe about four to 500 people lived there, but it would have been much smaller than what we would think of a town with four or 500 people living in it because they're living in tiny little mud huts jammed all together on the side of a really steep hill. It was a good place to put a town because if an enemy army's coming by, they might look at the steep hill that your tiny little town's on and just say, forget about that one, let's keep going. So it's on a really steep hill, really poor, and this angel Gabriel doesn't go to Jerusalem, doesn't go to Rome, doesn't go to Athens. God sends Gabriel to this little town of Nazareth. If you saw the title that I put up uh, talking about the sermon this week, uh, I quoted from the scripture, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. But, but that's what the people said. Like, yeah, Nazareth? Nazareth, really? God sent his top angel to Nazareth? Look at verse 27. It says, to a virgin betrothed to a man, so betrothed men engaged. The, the women got engaged age 12, 13, the men got engaged, age 17, 18, 19. So to a virgin, she's not been with a man, she's betrothed, she's engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, his lineage. Now he's poor, but his lineage goes back a thousand years to King David, the greatest king Israel ever had, and the virgin's name was Mary. The, word Mar the name Mary means bitter. And we would say, well, why would someone name their daughter bitter? If you were to go to our orphanage, this church operates in Namibia, in southern Africa, you'll find that many children are named, even today, to reflect the circumstances of their birth. And so the circumstances of a little child being born in Israel, or particularly maybe in Nazareth, would have been very bitter. These were hard, hard, hard times. And this angel shows up talking to Mary. This angel comes to Mary now telling her that God has a huge task for her. We're going to read the rest of the story. He has this task. You're going to conceive in your womb. You're going to bear this child. You're going to raise up the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Gabriel, from God, goes to Mary, a 12, 13-year-old girl, girl, dirt poor, don't believe any of the paintings of Mary where she looks like a model with perfect hair and beautiful and wonderful clothing. Dirt, dirt, dirt poor. Dirt poor. And Gabriel comes to her and says, this is the task God has for you. I guarantee you in Mary's mind is like, uh, me? Uh, this is now, there must be some mistake here. You've come to the wrong person. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, Jesus 
and he kept calling out all the religious teachers, right? All the religious teachers, prophets, whatever, the preachers of the time. And he said one time, you, you cross heaven and earth to make a land and sea to make one convert, and you make them twice as child of hell as you are yourselves. And you know what they were doing to the people of places like Nazareth? They were making them feel like dirt. They were the religious, the preachers, making them feel like dirt because they couldn't keep all the thousand different rituals that the religious leaders had added to the commandments that God had given them. So somebody like Mary, her self-image, right? The, the, the crazy thoughts that are going through her brain all of the time would have been, uh, yeah, me, really, really me. Let's go on here. Let's, let's look at in the Gospel of John. So here's where somebody says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We're jumping 30 years ahead. Jesus is now gathering people around him. Jesus captures a man named Philip's heart. Philip went to a friend, Nathaniel, said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. In other words, we found the Messiah. The Savior, all the scriptures have foretold that the Savior, this Messiah, is coming. And he says, it's, it's this Jesus from Nazareth, the son of, of Joseph. And as soon as Philip says, Nazareth, Nathaniel's like, yeah, right. So look at verse 46. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. And see that, he, he quotes, I mean, he says that immediately, right? Because that was a saying in the nation. And that's what Mary would have known. When this angel comes, it says, I have a huge task for you. I've got a huge task for you. God is calling you to do this. Last night I was preaching and there was a, a young woman there with a, a little baby. And uh, I uh, baptized the baby just a few weeks ago. And we all rejoiced together. And I knew the mother when she was, was this big. And I said, now, what if this child you're holding in your arms right now was the son of God? <laughs> And that's what the angel is saying to Mary. And in Mary's mind, it's like, uh, no, uh, me, I'm from Nazareth. I'm not good enough. I mean, that's what the preachers would have drooled in her head. You're third. You're not second class, third class. You're, 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 the, you're a loser. You grew up here. You're a loser. The question we're going to ask ourselves in this message this morning is this. When God is calling to your heart, when God is speaking to you, and your brain is saying, yeah, right, me? I'm not good enough for God. I'm not smart enough for God. I'm not strong. I'm not holy enough for God. When your brain is saying, I'm not, I'm not good enough, what do you do? You know God's calling to your heart. What do you do? I sat down with a, uh, a woman a few weeks ago, and that's exactly what she was saying to me. She, she's been asking me questions. I've seen her different places, and uh, she's been asking me questions. And she says, I keep wanting to come. I keep wanting to come. And then my brain just keeps saying, ah, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. What do you do when your brain says you're not good enough? Do you know that God's given you some task? He's calling you to, 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 to get involved in some kind of way of bringing his love to this world. He's calling you to, to do something that you know is going to be incredibly difficult for you. He's just calling to your heart. Maybe you're here and you've never opened that door of your heart to him and you're saying, I'm not good enough for him. What do you do? That's exactly the questions that would have been gone through Mary's mind. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of the life that you've lived up until this moment? Can anything good come out of that crazy thoughts that just keep attacking your brain over and over thing again? Can anything good come out of your life? Why would God be calling to me? Why would I begin to think God is speaking to my heart? Look in the Gospel of Matthew here. Now, this is when, uh, you remember, Joseph has a dream right after Jesus is born, and uh, an angel warns him to take the child and the mother and flee because the king is killing all the baby boys. So they flee down to Egypt. Jesus has grown up in a refugee camp in Egypt. Eventually that king dies. They come back. It says he went and lived, Joseph, taking his family in a city called Nazareth so that what was, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So Matthew says, yep, they ended up in Nazareth because the prophets foretold that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, I challenge you, 
to search through all the prophets of the Old Testament and see if you can find that prophecy that he will be called a Nazarene. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. And guess what? Nazareth didn't exist until about maybe the archaeologists think 50 to 100 years before the birth of Jesus. So what is Matthew doing here? He's using the word Nazarene, which meant somebody from Nazareth, the way the people of first century Israel used the word Nazarene. It was just a code word for loser, failure. That's what he said. He would be called, Jesus would be called a loser, a failure, a nobody, a nothing. Look in the prophet Isaiah. Look at this. He was despised and rejected. He's talking about Jesus. Despised. Despised. People didn't, the vast majority of the people didn't like, oh, God came. They didn't see his love. They didn't see the glory of God in him. They looked at this Jesus from Nazareth, right, and said, loser, loser. Nothing. He was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He didn't have it all together in the people's estimation. He was no savior. He was not even much of a rabbi, not much of a teacher, nothing. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. We got our first answer to our question. When God's calling to your heart and your brain is saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. God, if, what's going on in my head? What's going on in my life? I'm not good enough. Here's the first, first thing. You remember that Jesus understands. Jesus understands. He understands why you're saying to yourself, I'm not good enough. He understands why your brain is so crazy. He understands why you look at yourself as a loser, as a failure. He understands because that's how he was raised. That was what was bombarding his head from all directions, right? So Mary, that, that little 12, 13-year-old young woman where the angel's saying, you got this task. God has given you this job, right? What she needed to know is that the true and living God understood why she was beating herself up, why, why we beat ourselves up nonstop. Look at Psalm 22 here. But I am a worm and not a man. I am a worm. Read through this Psalm 22 and tell me that it's not talking about Jesus. This is what the people would have said about Jesus. He, he's, he's no man. He's no man. If he was a king, remember he, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, has him crucified and puts a sign up, King of the Jews. And the, the religious leaders say, could you please take that sign down? And Pilate said, I said what I said. This is your king. This is the kind of king you all have some loser like Jesus. I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised. When you start feeling like that, you start saying to yourself, I can't do this. I can't do, th I can't do this. You remember that Jesus understands. He understands. He's not judging you for the crazy thoughts that are beating yourself up. Look at verse seven then. He goes on, all who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. That's exactly what they did to Jesus, exactly what they did to Jesus. That's exactly how Mary would have been feeling. Mary would have, an angel shows up to Mary, not with beautiful hair, beautiful clothes, dirt poor, dirty, man, you didn't have baths and showers, right? You're dirty all the time. An angel shows up and says, you're gonna raise the son of God. Yeah. What we need to know is Jesus understands. Let's go back to Luke now. So he came to her, the angel came to Mary and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, we read in, in the scripture that when angels, the different accounts we have of angels showing up at different times, sometimes people recognize this was an, an angel from beyond uh, this world. Other times they thought this was somebody. Now, just somebody, a person. We don't know what Mary's thinking as this angel first shows up, but he says, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. That would have been the opposite of what all their religious teachers would have, she would have heard all the rabbis in the synagogue say about people like her. Like, favored one, the Lord is with you. She would have thought, yeah, uh, look at my life. 
Look at where I'm, I live. Uh, look, at, look at who I am. I don't think I'm a favored one. I don't think the Lord is with me. But in verse 29, she was greatly troubled at the same and just tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Now, if she wasn't recognizing yet that this was an angel, she might have thought maybe this is some Roman official, some Roman soldier who were extremely dangerous, especially to the young women, right? Extremely dangerous, so she's greatly troubled. Maybe this is some religious leader. Maybe she's thinking this is an angel. What is this all about? And she's trying to figure out what's going on. So at verse 30 then, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And here's the second answer to our question. What do you do when God's speaking to your heart? And your brain's saying, I'm not good enough? You remember, it's not about you. It's all about Jesus. It's not about where you've been and what you've done. It's all about where he went and what he did. It's not about you and me. When God says you are favored, when God says you have found favor in my eyes, it's not about because of who we are, right? It's not about who you are. It's about who he is. Yes, you have found favor in his eyes because he loves you. He loves you. Was it that Mary was better than everybody else? We know through the centuries, the church added all kinds of traditions and stories about Mary making as if she was better than everyone else. That's not the kind of thing the Bible says. The Bible says we're all sinners. The Bible says stuff we don't even like to hear. It says we're all worthless, right? Yeah, read it. Read it in the first few chapters of the book of Romans, what sinners we are. But guess what? God loves us. Oh, I wish I could be like oh, so many sermons I see online these days. Uh, I'm just joking. Like they're just basically uh, TED Talks, motivational talks with a few little Bible verses thrown in just to make us all feel good and happy about ourselves. We're a mess. We are a mess. Y'all can say amen. <laughs> you didn't want to say amen to that. We don't want, right? But here's what right, self-esteem fails. It doesn't work. But when you remember, it's not about you. It's about him. It's about Jesus. It's about this incredible love. It's all about God now saying to Mary, Mary, look, I know. I know the circumstances of your life. I know the, the struggles in your life. I know, Mary, you're not equipped to do this task. I know that, Mary. I know the crazy thoughts in your brain right this moment. But, Mary, you have found favor in my eyes. Look in the book of Ephesians here. Chapter two, for by grace you've been saved. Grace means unearned, undeserved favor. It's this unearned, undeserved love of God that he keeps pouring out upon our lives. He just keeps coming and coming with this grace. Can I remember, it's not about where I've been, what I've done, who I am, what my brain's telling me. It's all about what Jesus thinks about me. It's all about this God who says, I came to rescue, to save you. I came to put a huge calling on your life because I love you, because I love you. He says, you've been saved through faith. Mary's gonna need to trust the words of that angel. When he said to her, you have found favor with God. She's gonna have to trust that. Can you imagine raising the son of God? If anyone knew who he was, it was Mary. She knew he wasn't the son of some man on this earth. She knew who he was from the get-go. Can you imagine raising the Messiah, the Savior? She's going to have to trust that what that angel said was true. So God calls you to be a blessing to our children in our, in our children's ministries, right? And you say, I, I don't think, I, I don't know. He calls you to, to be part of our special needs ministry. He calls you to be a part of our youth ministry. He calls you to start reaching out to some neighbors and inviting them to come together for a small prayer group. He calls you to go to that person who doesn't have a friend and just start sharing the love of Jesus with them. And you say to yourself, I, I don't know. I, I don't think God could do that. It's not about you. It's all about him. It's all about his grace. You have faith then. You put your faith in what he did for you there on that cross. By grace, you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. 
So I'm remembering, I'm remembering, all right, he understands why I feel this way. He gets that. He was raised up in this mess. He gets that. And then I'm remembering it's not about me. It's about God. It's all about God. Look in in, uh, uh, Romans here. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Right before this, he said, look, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So, okay, it's not about me. So, pastor, you tell me I can just live my sinful life and it doesn't really matter? That's what the question here is. All right, there's just more grace. Is that what you're saying? So look at verse two then. He says, by no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? The way, in fact, that you will put to death, right, the junk in your heart, the, the, the junk in your heart that keeps leading you down the wrong roads, the way you'll put that to death is by trusting in the grace of God, by trusting it's not about you, by trusting that you are loved. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it, but you are loved. You know, we rise up to what people's expectations are of us. We rise up to what their estimation of us is, right? Here's this God who's saying, you can do all things in me. You, you, I have washed you clean by my blood shed on that cross. I've put a great calling on your life. You can rise up to this. You can put to death all the crazy thoughts. You can put to death the junk in your heart. You can put to death those sinful habits in your life if you'll trust in this amazing grace. If you'll remember, it's not about you. It's all about me. Mary's going to have to remember that when she's standing at the cross watching her son die on that cross 30 years, 33 years later, right? She's going to have to remember, God called me to this task. God called me to this task. I can do this. I can even watch him die. I can watch him die because God called me to this task. Wow. Let's go back to the Gospel of Luke now. And so this is still the angel now talking to Mary. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. In their language, it would have been pronounced Yeshua. It meant the Lord saves. And so at verse 32... He will be great. This is the angel talking to Mary. He will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. He's telling her exactly who this child is going to be at verse 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. The king of kings, the Lord of lords at verse 34. Wait a minute, a king growing up in Nazareth? I'm gonna ra- how am I going to raise a king? How is he going to know how to be a king growing up here with me as his mom? So Mary said to the angel, how sh- will this be since I'm a virgin? So her brain, right, immediately is stuck, wait a minute, in the very first thing he said, right? Uh, you're going to conceive in your womb. Well, I've never been with a man. How will this be? And then that question just goes on to all these other questions. Do you remember when Jesus is 30-some years old, they're still saying, oh, yeah, we know who your dad was, some Roman soldier, right? She's already thinking, Joseph ain't going to believe this. Joseph's not going to believe this. He's going to tell everybody, I'm going to be in big trouble. They might throw me over a cliff and kill me, because that's what they did sometimes for women who were unfaithful, right, with a Roman soldier. Uh, this is going to follow me the rest of my life. And, but she asks, how will this be since I'm a virgin? How can this possibly be? So at verse 35... The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. God himself, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Here's what God's saying to you when you say, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough, right? God himself will come, the Spirit of God, right? That's the promise when we put our faith in Jesus, the mercy of God, the forgiveness, the love of God comes to our life, and Jesus prays to the Father, and the Father sends the Holy Spirit. God himself comes to dwell within us. There's nothing you can't do. There's nothing that you will be unable to do, right? Because the infinitely powerful God comes to dwell in your heart when you put your faith in Jesus. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God, no earthly father. This child at verse 36 then, And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And so at verse 37, for nothing will be impossible 
with God. And so when your brain's saying you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, you remember this, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. If you would have known me when I was growing up, I was quiet, quiet, quiet. Hmm. And now all he does is talk, 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 talk. All I do is talk all day long to all kinds of people. If you would have known me when I was growing up, you would have said, that is impossible. Impossible. That quiet little kid talking in front of people, that quiet little kid talking to people who are pouring out their hearts to him, impossible. But nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. Whatever mountain he's calling you to climb, Maybe what he's saying is, I'm calling you to climb this mountain of great struggle now. I'm calling you to climb this mountain of of cancer. I'm calling you to climb this mountain of betrayal. I'm calling you to climb this mountain of, of, of whatever that's in front of you. I'm calling you to climb this mountain trusting in me. And you say, that's too much for me. How am I supposed to trust in you when you let this happen? And here's God saying, nothing's impossible with me. Nothing's impossible with you. I'm calling you to forgive this person who did all of this to your loved one. You say that's impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary, you can do this. You can raise this child, Mary. You, you, you're gonna have a strength and a wisdom and a, and a goodness in your heart that's far beyond yourself, Mary, because I'm coming to live in your heart. We remember nothing is impossible with God. Hey, we're looking at a a nation and a world right now that is doing exactly what the prophets foretold. I'm doing a Bible study, by the way, online. You can find our online Bible studies uh, on our website. Uh, I'm doing this one hour a week. We're looking at the book of Daniel, right? So in the the prophet Daniel, he said exactly this, the world's going to become just a harder and harder place in which to live, right? The chaos of this world, the wickedness of this world is just going to multiply and multiply. And that's what we're seeing, right? And it looks like this is beyond us. How? How how are we going to do what God calls us to do? How are we going to live godly lives in such an ungodly world? And here's God saying nothing. Maybe you're saying, how am I going to raise up my child? How is my grandchild ever going to, to, to walk with Jesus in this ungodly world? Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. We remember that. He understands our crazy thinking. He understands why we beat ourselves up. It's not about me anyway. It's all about him, and nothing is impossible with him. And so let's go now to the next verse here, verse 38. Mary said, so she answers the angel, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She says yes to God. She says yes to that angel. Look at this. Being an old baby boomer, I can't help but say those words, let it be. When Paul McCartney wrote his Beatles song, let it be, he was actually writing from this verse of scripture, right? Oh, really, I wish he would have written, let it be to me according to your word. I really wish he would have written that because that's what she did. She submitted herself to the word of God. She didn't just say, let it be, whatever. Whatever happens, I guess I can't do anything about it. No, she said, let it be to me according to your word. She submitted herself to the word of God. And that's what we do. When our brain's beating us up, we submit ourselves to the word of God. So when my brain is saying, you can't do this, you can't do this, then I submit myself to the word of God, which says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. When my brain's beating me up and saying, Craig, you're such a shameful person. That stain of sin in your life is so despicable. I submit myself to the word of God, which says that he remembers my sin no more. He removes my sin as far as from the east is from the west. We submit ourselves to the word of God. That's how we say yes to God when he's calling to our lives. We submit ourselves to the truth of the word of God. Look in Proverbs chapter 30 here at verse five. Every word of God proves true. And because every word of God proves true, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He shields us from all the stinking thinking, right, that attacks our brains. 
He shields us from, from all the, the, the garbage of this world that would say there's no point in even trying. There's no point in even believing in this God. There's no point in worshiping him. He doesn't want you anyway. No, we believe and submit ourselves to the word of God. Let it be to me according to your word, God. According to your word. God, you have promised. You have promised that if I will forgive that person who did me such wrong, you've promised that forgiveness comes to my life. You've promised that. God, so I'm going to submit myself to your word to receive this mercy. I need mercy to give mercy to those who have done me such wrong. I'm going to submit myself to every word of God. It all proves true. Mary said yes. The great church leader Martin Luther said that was the real miracle of the moment. The real miracle wasn't, he said, the fact that she conceived in her womb without an earthly father, he said that was a mere trifle for God. That's no big deal. The big deal, the amazing miracle, is that she said yes. Mary said yes. Maybe that's the big miracle God's wanting to do in your life right now. He's, the big miracle is this, that you would say yes to you know that next thing that God's calling you to. Maybe the next thing he's calling you to do is to put your faith in him to put your faith in him for the very first time. The miracle would be for you to say yes. Yes. You know what? We forgot to say this morning, we're having baptisms. It's not in your bulletin. We're going to have baptisms here next weekend during all of our Sunday worship services, during the last song that we sing. Maybe the big miracle is that you've been resisting going public with your faith. You've been resisting standing up in front of a congregation and getting baptized there, and you're going to say yes to God. You're going to say yes to God. I don't know what he's calling you to say yes to at this moment, but I know if you will say yes to him, he will be there. He will be there. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much, Lord God. You've been so good to us all the days of our lives. You've shown us such mercy, so much grace, You've loved us when we didn't begin to deserve it. And Lord God, this is our confidence. This is our courage. This is our strength, Lord God, that you have loved us with this amazing grace. And so, Lord God, we pray. We pray that we would say yes to you, that we would submit ourselves to your word, that we would do, that we would believe as you've called us to do, to believe. Lord God, we pray for each one of us here right now. Lord God, that we would hear you speaking to our hearts. We would hear you as Mary heard you speaking through that angel to her so long ago. That we would hear you speaking to our hearts right now. What's that one next right thing you're calling us to? That we would hear you in this moment, Lord God. That you would do that miracle in our lives, each one of our lives this moment, Lord right now that we would say yes to you that we would say yes lord i'm going to stop being angry i'm going to give it to you that we would say yes lord i'm going to go be a blessing to that person yes lord i'm going to open that front door of my heart to you yes lord i'm going to believe i'm going to believe Oh, Father, we want to see you move in this room. We want to see you move in our hearts, Lord God. And we love you and we thank you. You took that young girl, Mary, and you, you did an amazing thing. Lord, take each one of our hearts, each one of our lives. Work through us all, Lord God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to this altar to pray. Maybe you know you need to come and pour out your heart. Maybe you would come just up here and just pray for all of us, whatever your prayer is. You're welcome to come. Let's stand and let's sing. A star in the sky, a Savior is born. Jesus Messiah has come. What happened that night will ring on forever till every song has and so your praise goes on 
never ending your praise goes on how sweet is the sound it's been two thousand years we're still singing your song hallelujah your praise goes on Shepherd stood a watch, and three wise men worshipped the babe who assembled the earth. Oh, what happened that night? Away in a manger changed the whole universe. Your praise goes. The earth let it ring out Every tribe, every tongue come and sing out Glory to God in the highest Oh, glory to God in the highest Your praise goes on you and we ask that you would dismiss us with your blessing. We pray that you would bless and keep each one here. Make your face to shine upon us. Lift up your countenance upon us. Give us your peace. This Advent season and all throughout the new year, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.